The quality of the dance is reflected by the community that you build around it. It doesn't matter if they're black or white or Hispanic or whatever, wherever they're from. Dance immediately connects you to somebody. And it just creates this intimacy almost with someone, even if they're across the room. Everybody has different gifts. Everyone is unique and inspired in their own way. The choreographic process of creating a dance that expresses an experience is empowering. It's the how that we did it that's so important in the story. When you dance, everybody sees everything about you. You are an interpreter of other people's voices. In my end of the art world of dance is really stretching to make changes about how dance is produced and what is dance. It's your voice and nobody can teach you that. You are responsible for finding it, for exploring it, and for figuring out how to make that voice become embodied in a dance. I think that dance and art should be meaningful, and I feel like you need to think about something that's relevant, a story to tell. Please welcome Bob Middleton, director and owner of the Arts Insurance Program. Thank you. I'm excited and honored to be supporting Dance USA and its membership at this year's conference. Uh, in 2007, I was first invited to speak at the Dance USA conference in Chicago. And I became immediately enamored of the organization, the passion, the enthusiasm of its performers, the administrators, and supporters. And ever since then, I've been trying to find a way to get to each conference every year. So I finally figured it out. Um, <laughs> um, in, although we work with numerous organizations and their members in the arts community, I find that Dance USA has a unique passion and vitality that's shown through the honorees, through the individuals, and the commitment they have to their art form. And I can say that this is one of my favorite events on an annual basis. Uh, to give an analogy, we find that uh, it, the first dance company that I actually worked with was Palabalus in 2005. And as I was going up to their um, office in the woods of Connecticut, my alternator fell off of my two, uh, 1985 Mercedes going up the New Jersey Turnpike. So they, they stapled it on, but um, I uh, went to a um, car dealership and they sold me three batteries. So I stuck them in the back, and as I would drop one in, it would slowly, eventually uh, fall, it would uh, wind down, and so we just drop another one in. So that got us into uh, their offices, and it was a white knuckle trip, but I got back to Baltimore. Um, and I find that at budget time and over the years, a lot of our clients have also experienced the white knuckledness of the budgeting process or everything else. But the companies persevere, they survive, and they continue, which is amazing. And um, I can say that um, every year um, I find uh, the commitment even greater. So I want to thank Amy, her staff, the board, the trustees, and the membership of Dance USA. Please continue your fierceness and your dedication as we'll be in the seats. Thank you.
Please welcome Amy Fitterer, Executive Director of Dance USA. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome officially to Austin, Texas. It's so great to be here. So I am just very excited to be sitting here looking at all of you and also to know that we have a live stream going on. So I would like to take a moment and welcome everybody who is also with us on the live stream. As you have seen through last night and some of the videos, there is just great dance here in Austin, Texas. And we continue to try to unearth and unpack this really vibrant community and showcase it nationally so that all of you can come back and continue to engage with this dance community. As you know, the Dance USA Conference is put together through many different partnerships, sponsors, funders, the staff, the board, and of course, the local community. So I'd like to start us off by thanking those people who have helped make this conference possible. If you could please hold your applause until I've gotten through um, the initial listing, that would be great. I would like to acknowledge our major foundation sponsors, the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, Harkness Foundation for Dance, and the Schubert Foundation. I would also like to acknowledge our host partners, Ballet Austin, the City of Austin, Sterling Events, the Long Center, and the Palmer Events Center. Thank you. We also have more host partners this year than we've had in past conference cities in our campus style. So I would like to acknowledge the Austin Symphony, the University of Texas Department of Theater and Dance, Retail Me Not, IBC Bank, and the Austin Convention and Visitors Bureau. Thank you. And as you heard from Bob just now, I would like to acknowledge our platinum sponsor, the Arts Insurance Program. This year, Dance USA has some very special gold sponsors, really longtime supporters of dance in our country, DeWitt Stern, Harlequin, and Patrick and Jeanette Keating. Thank you so much for your support. And our silver sponsors are Capacity Interactive, Freed of London, KRL, KLRU, who made those beautiful videos that we've been seeing of the dance community, and the Texas Commission on the Arts. This year's bronze sponsors are Arts Consulting Group, Body Wrappers, Management Consultants for the Arts, and Ovation. Thank you for your support. If you've been enjoying uh, the Wi-Fi, uh, if you've been enjoying the plugging and charging stations, if you've been playing around on the mobile app, a lot of our technology is sponsored by KMP, so thank you for that. And in true Austin style, those of you who know Whole Foods was started here, so we've got Whole Foods as a sponsor, the Alamo Draft House, Kind Bars, Tiff's Treats, and HEB. So it really takes a lot of people to pull this conference off. So let's take a moment to acknowledge who's here in Austin. You can take a look here up on this map. We have conference attendees from all over the country, which is just fabulous. And you know, we actually have over 130 first timers here. So raise your hand if you're a first timer. <laughs> And if you have been coming to a Dance USA conferences for more than 10 years, raise your hand. Woo, look at that. What about 20 years? This field is not nearly as big as we think it is, so these are your allies, your colleagues, your peers. Please reach out to each other, learn from each other. This is why we come together, to acknowledge that we can have a fellowship together in supporting dance. 
So many of you are aware Dance USA has core values of equity, inclusion, and diversity. And I think it's really important that we take these on as values and not just a program here or an activity there. Having it be a value means that this is something that all the work that Dance USA does must pass through this value. We're certainly not perfect all the time, but we're steadfast in our commitment to keep trying to be a more equitable, a more inclusive, and a more diverse organization. We also want to be working with all of you to be helping you and learning from you about how can we make our field more equitable. We are living in a very, very complicated time. It's exciting, it's full of opportunity, but it's also fraught with a lot of social change. Uh, just in the past year, when I think about the things that I have been having to deal with as an executive director of an arts nonprofit, um, we have tremendous racial issues going on in this country, and we all need to fight for racial justice. There also are many different populations in this country that are oppressed and overlooked. And so really taking the time to understand what your personal power is and your personal privilege is to help you understand how can you help your fellow man. Because together, we need to be supporting each other to conquer what's going on in this world. I have also been having to deal with um, there has been a you know, constant increase in single shooter issues, and the National Endowment for the Arts had a convening in the past six months uh, with a handful of arts leaders and individuals from FEMA and the Department of Interior to talk about emergency preparedness. This is something that is so low on a lot of our you know, agendas as arts leaders because we're overworked and under-resourced, and how on earth do we make this a priority? But we have some very serious problems with uh, natural disasters and the single shooter and active shooter issues that are going on in this country. So we need to think about that as well, which is really complicated when we're trying to also think about all the other issues. And then, of course, there's the religious freedom bills that we're passing through in the states. And these are discriminatory in their nature. So how do we deal with this if you run an arts organization in one of those states? So these are just some of the few issues that are coming at us from all corners. The funding sources continue to change. Our audiences continue to change. So how do we deal with this? That's why we need to be together, to figure this stuff out together. So a couple of programs that Dan USA is doing. One, we're really excited to be moving forward with our staff residency program. This is to help Dan USA get on the ground. You know, we're based in Washington, D.C., and it can be hard to really feel that you understand what's going on in local dance communities unless you are there in person. So we're very excited that we are going to be relocating staff for a period of time to New Orleans, Kansas City, Portland, and Las Vegas. This will be taking place over the next 12 months. You will be able to hear and learn about our findings and our experiences uh, at next year's conference in Kansas City, Missouri. In addition, a very important activity that Dan USA has been doing is expanding our national company roster. This is a listing of all 501c3 dance companies in the United States with budgets above $100,000. Up until recently, we stopped at that $100,000 marker, and we did not collect information on companies with budgets smaller than that. The listing had about 400 companies on it. It's the most visited web page that we have. Well, we are expanding it to not have a budget constraint, and we are hoping that by the first quarter of 2017, we will be able to have a listing of all 501c3 dance companies in our country, regardless of budget size, and it will be free and available on our website. In addition, as many of you know, not everybody wants to have their own 501c3, and for some artists, for decades, they have not had their own 501c3. Whether or not you have your own 501c3 status does not mean that you are a great artist or not. It has no impact on your quality of your art. Dance USA wants to recognize those arts groups out there that are working as under a fiscal sponsor. And so to go along with our listing of 501c3 dance companies, we will also be growing a list of fiscally sponsored dance groups to validate and recognize them on our website as well.
Another area that we've been working on is trying to reach the smaller budget dance groups and the independent artists. And so we're thrilled to be partnering with Fractured Atlas for a second year and to be hosting Dance Business Boot Camp. So this is all day tomorrow. Uh, if you are an independent artist, fiscally sponsored, or you work in a budget size $200,000 or lower, you are welcome to go to Dance Business Boot Camp. Um, this is going to be broken up into two parts in the morning and then in the afternoon. And it is free to all Austin dance artists with the generous support of the City of Austin's Economic Development Department. So thank you to the city for that support. We're also trying to balance out some of our work. You know, we still do the dance forum every January in New York City as a pre-conference event to APAP. This year, we're trying out a pilot. We're going to do Dance Forum West at WA in August. It'll be in Los Angeles on August 29th. And because one of the biggest issues in our country in the dance field is about touring and performance opportunities, and how that is so drastically changing, it's getting very hard, and yet we're finding artists are fighting to find ways to perform. So we're going to continue to take a look at the relationships that you are making to create performance opportunities. And also at WA, we're going to be taking a look at how do you market the lesser known artist so that presenters can feel confident in putting you on stage. So you've probably been hearing about Dance USA's partnership with the Wallace Foundation. Again, trying to understand our changing environment, the Wallace Foundation has a major national program on building audiences for dance. Dance USA, along with our other national arts service organizations, is serving as the communication sponsor. The Wallace Foundation has generously put this research report into all of your tote bags, taking out the guesswork, a guide to using research to build audience arts audiences. The Wallace Foundation convened a group of NSO leaders earlier this year, and one of the things I was most struck by was the power of really, really, really good market research, and also realizing that because we're frequently under-resourced, we don't do the market research that we need to do. So I'm grateful that the Wallace Foundation has been putting together their learning to share it with all of us. You'll also know that later today we're going to have a breakout session featuring two grantees who are just in the beginning of their work with the Wallace Foundation, but they have completed extensive market research with the support of the Wallace Foundation. So you'll get to learn, uh, hear from them, what did they learn about their communities? What did they uh, find as a surprising fact about their dance audiences? And how are they thinking about changing their work to be more responsive? So we have a very special guest with us today. Many of you know that there is a new program director for the arts at the Ch Doris Duke Charitable Foundation. Maureen Knighton is here with us to say some welcoming remarks to all of you. She's been very generous with her time. She was here all day yesterday with our Engaging Dance audience grantees, and she's speaking on a panel later today. So it is my great pleasure to introduce the wonderful and exciting Maureen Knighton. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thanks, Amy, for that wonderful and generous introduction. And also thanks to you and the Dance USA board for the invitation to be with you. Uh, I'm here on behalf, of course, of the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation, very pleased to be with you. And I'm bringing greetings on behalf of our CEO, Ed Henry, our board of directors and the staff at DDCF, and of course, my colleagues in the arts program, Cheryl Lee Kamia and Lillian Osi Botang. I've been a longtime supporter of dance, but never imagined myself in this position to provide even more support to the field. So I really feel a special privilege and responsibility in that regard. Uh, and I'm very excited about the work we have ahead of us collectively. I've been a presenter, I've been a funder, and a lifelong fan uh, of the discipline. So I'm, I'm truly excited. I've been on the job now just about seven weeks, and although I've not been there long, I know. Okay, but listen to this part. Uh, you know, I've been meeting with a lot of grantees, and, and they all want to know, have you decided what the arts program is going to do next? Well, I haven't. I've, I've, 
I feel like I need to spend a little more time getting to know the grantees and doing some research before making any radical changes. Uh, I'm going to take my time with doing that. Um, so although I can't tell you precisely what we're going to be doing, two years from now, or even a year from now, I can tell you this, the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation is absolutely going to continue to support dance at the levels it's currently supporting the field, and it's my hope that we'll find new and additional ways to support the field. This is what Doris wanted. It also happens to <laughs> Also happens to be what I'd like, so that works out neatly, doesn't it? On that note, I want to wrap up by announcing that the DDCF board recently approved a $1.9 million grant to Dance USA to support round four of engaging dance audiences. We are really pleased with what we've seen happen through that program already. We look forward to continuing to learn from and with the participants in that program as well as from the field at large. And I look forward to meeting many of you over the remainder of the conference. Enjoy. Thank you. Let's just have one more really big round of applause for the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation. I know we're in good hands with Maureen and uh, her years of experience at the Nathan Cummings Foundation and the Upper Manhattan Empowerment Zone and 651 Arts. She is just going to be a wonderful ally in, as we tackle all of these issues in our country. So now I just have a couple of fun logistics and we get to go on to the, the plenary and the conversation. I'm obsessed with our mobile app. <laughs> So if you're not on it, can you please get on the mobile app? <laughs> and if you want me to help you, I'm happy to help you figure out how to get on the mobile app. Um, it is a conference that's taking place virtually at the same time that this conference is taking place. You can post any of your thoughts, your ideas, your questions. You can challenge each other. You can respond to each other. It's, it's real-time dialogue. And one of the things that I also love is we can't be in all the places at the same time, and there's some very, very interesting breakout sessions going on later today and over the next two days. But when I'm sitting in a breakout session, if I glance down at the mobile app, I can see some of the comments that are going on. And later, I can actually catch up on some of the discussion that took place. We also have some competitions, because who doesn't love games? So the leaderboard, we actually, as you know, if you're on it, we're tracking who's winning, how many posts, you know, you're doing. So we give prizes. So, and and if, it'll be at the closing plenary. We're going to announce the winners, and the staff keeps this a surprise for me, what the, the prizes are, but we will announce them at the closing. So keep posting, those of you who are really competitive. And then we've already launched our selfie scavenger hunt. Uh, so you're just going to have to follow what's going on on the mobile app and the directions and the hints come up and then you have to go somewhere, take a selfie with something and post it on the mobile app. I think you need to make sure though, that you post with the correct hashtags or else it won't count. Uh, registration. This is a good place to get your questions answered. So please go to the registration table at any point during our conference for any kind of question. And then the staff, we wear uh, badges that have blue ribbons on the bottom, so if you see anybody that's a staff person, please, well, first thank them, because we're actually a really small staff, so this is like our big event for the year, and then uh, ask them your question. So now it is my pleasure to introduce you to Ron Berry, who's going to moderate <laughs> what I think is going to be a very interesting discussion with our plenary speakers. I hope that they get to really go deeper. I was listening to their conversation in the green room just now, and I was like, wow, I should just be filming this. Um, Ron Berry is the founder and artistic director of Fusebox Austin. This is a multidisciplinary arts organization. In over a decade that it's been around, it has won over 200 awards. It runs a major arts festival here. Ron is a like down-to-earth, kind, funny guy who is extremely intelligent and extremely creative. And I feel very confident that you are going to be in good hands listening to this dialogue. 
This is also the first time we've ever done this this year. We have opening and closing plenaries are the exact same group of people. And not all of them have come to a Dance USA conference before. So they are going to help us be a mirror for your experience. So they're going to go through the conference all tomorrow, later today, and on Saturday. And then at the end of Saturday, they're going to come back and they're going to reflect as well. So I hope that you enjoy listening with them and then dialoguing with them over the next two days. So I'll be back at the end of the plenary, but enjoy. Oh, thank you. Awesome. <laughs> hey, everyone. Thanks so much for being here. It's a real pleasure and an honor. I'm Ron Berry from Fusebox. Um, I'm here with some esteemed, fabulous, amazing colleagues. Uh, we're, we're setting this up as a very sort of informal conversation about some really juicy, uh, I think, juicy topics that are really vital and relevant. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen this TED Talk about experts. Uh, there's this... Uh, kind of wonderful, well, they're talking about how when you're in conversation with someone who has been framed as a sort of expert, that like literally part of your brain shuts down. Um, <laughs> so I like, thought that was like super interesting uh, and actually has all kinds of implications and we can sort those out over the next few days. Um, but I think that also to me uh, had implications for this. We are not experts, we are peers, we are here hashing things out along with you. Um, and we look forward to hashing these things out over the next uh, three, three, four days and then on into our lives. Um, so that's kind of the, the spirit of this thing. Um, where the, there's kind of three or four general topics that we're looking at today. We're looking at funding. Hey. Uh, we're looking at uh, technology. Uh, and we're looking at the social responsibility of dance uh, and equity issues, which are obviously huge and vital and things we, we all need to be, be looking at. Um, so we're just going to say a few uh, words about ourselves, and then we're going to jump in, uh, and then we'll talk with you all afterwards about this stuff. Um, so she gave a, a quick intro of myself. We are a nonprofit arts organization here in Austin. We just finished our 12th edition. We started very small. We had a budget of $5,000 our first year and we've slowly built our organization and our annual festival over the past 12 years. Um, it began with really uh, an idea to, and a desire to create a more meaningful uh, exchange of ideas across art forms and across geography. Um, I was a theater artist working in Austin. I think sometimes there's this notion that if you keep working at something, you'll slowly get better and better at it. And for me, I just felt like I was hitting my head against the same wall for like six years in a row. And then like in a, in a two minute conversation with an artist from the UK, I was like, oh my God, thank you. Now I can get on with my life. So I'm, I'm, a, uh, <laughs> I'm a big believer in this notion of exchange and encountering ideas that are perhaps outside of your immediate sphere. Um, and that's sort of what we've built our, our festival around. And we've tried to, to build on that and invite other perspectives uh, and vantage points into the shaping of what we're doing. And that's really at the heart of what we're doing. So that's a little bit about me. Um, do you want to say a few words about yourself? Prakash? Sure. Um, uh, my name is uh, Prakash Mohandas. Um, I am the founder of uh, Agni Dance Company here in Austin and uh, Agni Entertainment. Uh, we started back in 2007 as, a, as, a, as the first Bollywood dance company in Austin. Uh, and, and since then, we've branched out into performance, um, education, fitness, and we also have an entertainment company that does uh, touring Bollywood musicals in the US and Canada, and we work on film projects as well. So these are cross-border film projects uh, that we mostly fund through film funds and uh, other avenues. So uh, we do a gamut of things, but uh, we're really happy to call Austin our home. Okay. Thank you. Sandra? My name is Sandra Organ Solis, and um, I was formerly a dancer with Houston Ballet as its first black ballerina. And um, after my, my career dancing with them, I uh, started my own dance company called Sandra Organ Dance Company, which I proceeded to change to Earth and Vessels. Um, and I, that took its course, uh, 16 seasons, and I dissolved the company a couple years ago, and I've now uh, relocated to the Texas Hill Country with my husband. And um, I'm in a bit of a transition right now. 
um, teaching a little bit here and there and trying to meet uh, the needs a bit of a more retirement community, uh, which is uh, underserved, I would say, in dance. Uh, <laughs> and they need to be more served. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But um, I'm happy to be here and bring my perspective. And I'm getting to know the Austin dance community as well. I'm rather new to it. I'm also straddling a little bit of work in the San Antonio area. So um, I'm just trying to put down new roots in the Texas Hill Country. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm Elliot Gray Fisher. I'm co-director of Arcos Dance, um, which is five years old, and we relocated from Santa Fe to Austin about two and a half years ago. Um, we focus on multimedia performance, so we're trying to figure out um, how to create at the intersection of dance, film, theater, new media, and visual art. Um, and we're also excited to be part of the Austin community now. Um, we've found it very fruitful um, since we've moved mm -hmm. here. So. Awesome. Thank yeah. you. So let's just dive. We're just going to start talking about that. We were uh, uh, we were actually having a really kind of uh, spirited, fun <laughs> conversation in the green room uh, about technology. So I just want to let's just start with that little nugget. I think it's also particularly interesting in Austin that is in a city that is experiencing, I mean, just <laughs> massive change right now, mm. and a lot of that is being driven by the technology sector. Um, there's tons of uh, companies and businesses moving here. Um, it's a city that is very technologically savvy in many ways, uh, and so I actually think that makes a lot of sense. There's a lot to, to unpack and talk about that. Um, but so I just kind of we'll open this up to, to all three of you and how you think about technology. I mean, I always sort of think about both the uh, the sort of infinite possibilities of technology and what we're able to do now that perhaps we weren't able to do. Uh, but I also think it's just really interesting to look at like what's happening to us culturally. <laughs> like what is our relationship with technology? Like like this has become a new universal sort of gesture and like body <laughs> position. Like everyone knows what that is. Like that's weird. Uh, so like what's happening to us? Um, so let's just. I'm just Dig in, start talking. Do you want to <laughs> this is the kind of action we're getting we back We to were not like this in the dressing room. <laughs> well, we, our, our company is yeah. invested in working with technology, uh, deeply invested in working mm. with technology. And our perspective is uh, we kind of try to take a historical look at it. And we see, uh, we consider all of the things that we work with technologies. So dance is a technology. Um, we uh, include yep. narrative, storytelling, old tech, very old technologies, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then there have been waves of, you know, new technologies. And every time that they roll around, uh, we have similar reactions. It's, you know, what the hell is happening to us? You know, it's like electricity, right? A hundred years ago, the automobile, you know, all, all of these things were major, major issues. And we like to think that maybe this time that we're living in is unique. Um, but maybe it's a little less so than, than we'd like to think. So what are these digital technologies? One thing that you said is they, they give the promise, at least, of kind of endless possibilities, mm -hmm. which is in some ways terrifying, because as artists, we want some kind of limitations and limits in which to work. Um, and, and we don't know how to use them. They're, they're, they are changing very quickly. Mm -hmm. So that produces some anxiety. And what we try to do with our work is um, both try to figure out how to, how to use these technologies that are being created and, uh, and make that a conversation that we're having with the audience. Mm. So the way that we use technology is, is visible and um, we're, we're interested in telling new stories and creating a mythology that reflects our contemporary society and the contemporary way that we use these new technologies. Mm. So you don't tell them to turn off your cell phones or... No, some, sometimes, show. in fact, if they come to the show that we're um, going to be a part of tomorrow night and Saturday night before our piece, we ask the, everyone to take out and turn on their cell phones. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. And we'll see how that goes. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah. And, and you, what's, your, what's your relationship with technology? How are you thinking about it? Well, I think I would think about it in, in two ways. Um, mm -hmm. I think technology, and when I'm talking about technology, I'm talking about uh, digital technology. I think that differs in the way you think about it if you are an individual dancer that's dancing by yourself. Um, you don't want anybody to watch, uh, and you're a dancer, and that's, that's your passion. That's fine. Uh, 
Um, but digital technology takes a different shape for you if you are a performance artist. If you want other people to see your work, if you want the world to see your work, if you want to reach out to other artists, that's a completely different ball game. Um, because think about this, like if you were a dancer, uh, maybe 20 years ago, 30 years ago, and there was no internet. Uh, imagine that to now, to how much dance you know, how much you know about other dance forms, and how many dancers you know across the world. There's a big difference in that. So adopting technology to me, as a performance artist, to me is almost inherent. Um, it's, it's something that, uh, that it's, it's a very active part of a performance artist's life. As, and, and as a tool to connect and share right. uh, dance ideas, practices. Right. And that links to, in my, in my world, it links to funding as well. Ah. Because a big part of that um, is, is being in, in, in funding, or when you're talking to investors or you know, uh, other private donors, is, is to show the networking capability, your outreach. So I, I can't imagine anybody not pitching the idea that I have a website that reaches, I don't know, uh, a million people. Like these kind of numbers are so important to the way we think about dance and the way we think about how people fund it mm. that it's, uh, it's, it's almost impossible to not adopt it. Yeah, yeah. That's super, super interesting. And we'll get back to the funding thing in a moment, but I'm glad that you brought that up. That's exciting. And, and Sandra, how Well, with my dance company, um, I found that having an idea of how many people had come to the website or how many hits was a great demographic or information mm. to throw into a grant you know, report um, to say that we're reaching more people through those means mm. as well as through blogs, and which is kind of probably old school to all y'all up here on the <laughs> stage. But um, I think about um, the sites that are hosted by our peers. Mm. And um, I was very impressed with the uh, um, memoirs of blacks and ballet.org. And there's some representatives of that here today. Mm. Um, because, you know, it's a chance to kind of take out your story and um, to present your story for yourself and also for others to see when the, the media is not coming your way to ask those questions and to take charge over uh, your own content. Yeah. Um, so that's the way I kind of see it. I also see it now as a movement facilitator, um, mm. this thing. You know, we're going to be correct in that posture <laughs> till we die. Mm. So. Um, <laughs> And everybody's going to have a part in that, mm. as long as we're doing this, mm. you know, and, you know, bringing it up and all this stuff, you know, all these different things about our posture. So being in a retirement community, I can see it already. And um, I, so we were talking about it being an extension of ourselves, mm. you know, like people are like, don't, don't tell me I can't bring my phone because um, it's an extension of who I am. And for our young people, that might be very much the case. But they're also going to have a hell of a time with their neck later on in life. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I would just say that we as dance movement mm. specialists are going to have something to offer them. Mm. As um, those... <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah, I love not it. already. I, I love this, this notion of, and this is in a way related to what you were saying, but the, the technology as a way to uh, create these peer-to-peer -peer exchanges, uh, an exchange of information, of stories, I think it's really powerful that it, it sort of flattens and democratizes in a way that's like really profound. Obviously, that's not just something that's playing out in the dance arena, but mm. all over the place. But I think to me, that's been a really exciting uh, development that technology has has allowed. We were we were um, we were talking about a couple other things backstage that I thought were interesting that were leading to other this this was spiraling into <laughs> like really interesting. So. When we were talking about, uh, a few months ago, we were hosting this panel discussion with Andy B. Parson from Big Dance Theater, David Newman, and Oakley Akpakwasili. And they were really talking about their practice, their dance practice, and how, I, I mean, in some ways not surprisingly, it's really rooted in their bodies. And there was uh, a, a bit of a, a spirited debate between the three panelists and some younger folks in the audience who were really talking about this uh, not necessarily on stage technologies, but specifically on more online platforms, Instagram, Facebook, uh, a digital presence. And they were, some people in the audience are really making the case that for them that was an extension of their body. Um, and that was part of their practice and their dance practice was this online presence. And I think there was some real, in, in some ways those were like two really different paradigm shifts. Um, and I think there was a, a uh, part of it I think was also 
uh, some artists saying, look, this is, my, this is my instrument and this is all I have the bandwidth to like, really uh, dive into and work with. Um, but I also felt like there was a bit of a political statement that like, being present in my body is a stance that I want to take and I want to own and uh, that I want to be a, sort of be behind. This is, what I'm, this is what I'm saying with my work. Um, so I don't know how, how you all uh, think about that. If you think about that dynamic, this, it feels like a, a shift in how we're thinking about just our bodies. Um, yeah, one of the things we were also talking about backstage is, is artificial intelligence, which is this hot topic that is yeah. in you know, more and more articles every day. And um, we're actually working on a, a, a show that deals with um, this idea of artificial intelligence, which you know, everyone's talking about, is going to become prevalent and may even you know, exceed the capabilities of hu humans. But one of the things that we've considered as we've talked about this is that the body is, is the gap. I mean, you know, mm. our technology is extremely advanced now. We can sense all sorts of things, um, get, collect all kinds of data, um, but there's, there's something ineffable that, you know, we think at this point, from everything we've seen so far, we don't think maybe our technology will be able to reach, mm. you know? Yay. <laughs> Yeah, maybe we're maybe we're foolhardy in think, in believing that, but but we'd like to think that that's the case. Yeah, Just yeah. in the way that they've talked about, you know, uh, forty percent of the jobs are, you know that exist today will be replaced by robots within the next couple decades, right? Uh, at every level um, and in every um, sector, um, we like to think we hope that artists and artistry and the kind of the creative process and the the um, very uh, irrational kind of work that we all do a lot of the time will never actually be able to re be replicable, that we will actually remain relevant in some way as humans, right? Uh, with bodies, yeah? As much, as much technology yeah. as there is, right? <laughs> yeah, actually, this is a conversation I had with somebody recently about, about how much of the aesthetic sense would, would a computer be able to eventually learn. Uh -huh. Uh, in, in being able to create some of those things. I think so being in the arts field, all of us I think have a, a vast advantage over AI uh, from, from how we know it now, uh, and that's gonna be great. Uh, but there was a point that I think you brought up about collaborative mm. portions of it, and, and I think that's what's uh, gonna be, I think, cool when it comes to technology going forward with dance is um, we know now that music is, is very collaborative. Mm -hmm. You can make music across, across continents, uh, no problem, mostly because it's available in some kind of written form, and you can exchange it in a written form, and people can understand it. Uh, unfortunately, dance is still very, a very visual, physical medium. Uh, we have things like Lava Notation, but nobody really uses dance notation to communicate, saying, hey, I created this piece, go read it, right? Uh, <laughs> but, but, but it might change. You might, we might be able to come up with some kind of a language that, that breaches that barrier, eventually makes dance very collaborative, um, you know, talking about simulators and things like that. I could make, I could create a dance piece with my friend back in India uh, online, and we're we're actually looking at each other while we're dancing. Mm. Uh, and these are all future state amazements that can come into the way dance is created. Mm. You're still using your body, but you're just mm. putting things on it. Yeah, so, so you, is this something that you're already doing? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm working on something called Dancecribe 1.0, which is a language for dance. Uh, primarily created through Braille for the visually impaired, mm. but it's meant to also solve the larger problem of creating what we call dance theorists. Mm. If you think about music theorists, there are people who can write music. There are people who have been blind who have written music, mm -hmm. uh, but we don't have anything like that in dance. So it means that if I'm a visually impaired person, I have to be physically taught. Mm. I can't read the same dance and do the same dance as five other people <laughs> if it's just given to me in writing. And that is what we're working on. So it's 1.0 because we're just trying to develop the model, mm -hmm. but it's going to be open source after that. Wow. So that's huh. super interesting. Nice. Um, I think it's also interesting to think about uh, the, again, I was sort of alluding to this earlier, and maybe we'll sort of sh let, allow this to <laughs> shift into some other things. But again, in, in Austin right now, this, uh, the, tremendous change that the city is experiencing. Uh, a lot of it, not all of it, is related to technology 
industry. And two, I, I hear two things a lot. One, that like a lot of the new uh, money that's coming in is very hard to access. It is a very <laughs> tough nut to crack philanthropically. So there's sort of that thing. Um, and then I also feel like it's what it's just in, kind of inherently doing to the cost of living here, that so many long-time, lifelong residents, uh, and as well as artists, um, are getting priced out of uh, this city. And this is not, Austin is not unique in its uh, experiencing of this problem, but uh, I think Austin is experiencing this in a really profound way. Um, to me, when I think about funding for the arts in Austin, I think that it, in some ways it, it really has to begin, or at least one of the first conversations we have to have is actually just space for artists to be making work. That there is increasingly fewer and fewer, especially if we're talking about affordable spaces for artists, dance makers to rehearse, to make work, and show their work. Um, I don't know if you all, uh, I mean, uh, what your current experience with this is, if you've seen other examples in other cities, uh, other strategies for tackling this, this issue, um, but I'd love to hear from, from you uh, with regards to this. Um, so I think this is at least my perspective on maybe a solution. Uh, and this is kind of drawing from other sectors or other industries that use this model. So if you think about the startup technology sector, mm -hmm. they have these wonderful co-working space models mm -hmm. that I don't think our community uses enough. Mm -hmm. um, there are spaces that we have that we rent, which is quite different. Uh, and, and you want to say co-working space is a rental model, but, but I think the way, in one of the ways to solve this problem might be that, that community, local uh, folks are not relying on an organization or a charitable foundation or some, somebody to build something for them. Uh, the way to think about that might be to kind of get together mm -hmm. and start working on these co-working spaces. You know your capacity, you know how many hours you rent, you know how many hours you want, you know what kind of performances you do. Start getting together and, and start looking at more collective spaces for dance um, and, and not, and like I said, not wait for somebody to build something for you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Did you, did you want to talk about? Uh, just a little bit. I'm more, yep. I can just only talk about what's happened in Houston. Um, so there was a small group of arts organizations who got together and had a huge needs assessment in depth done by you know, a con consulting firm and um, that brought many performing arts groups together. Um, and that took almost five years, but now they have this beautiful space called The Match. And it's um, uh, mid, somebody yell it out. What is the mid? Thank you. <laughs> it's a little bit too much of a mouthful for me to remember. <laughs> match. The match, which I thought was great. And it's right across the street from uh, the historically black theater, the ensemble. Mm -hmm. It's on a rail station line. Awesome. It's got you know, a contract with a, a restaurant tour, so you can mm -hmm. come there and have snacks. There's a breezeway. It's a lovely space. And um, before that, although um, Dance Source Houston had taken over um, the occupation of what we call Barnevelder, or the barn, and that was also really just meant for dance, and the dance community came together with a, a local modern dance company who started it out and built three spaces, two rehearsal spaces, and a little small black box. And that's where a lot of uh, the dance in Houston, in the mid-sized, the smaller arts organizations took place. And so now they have these two venues. Um, and so there have been kind of, and then I think there's just a lot of the universities have gotten new spaces, as well as you know, you've got a ton of dance academies and you know, fitness studios that don't always have, you know, hours of operation that everybody's there. So I think people get creative with that and mm -hmm. forge those kind of relationships or, or barter and say, hey, I'll teach a ballet bar class and, you know, I, I'll use your space to um, reverse my company. Mm -hmm. So those are just some <laughs> couple of things that you can awesome. do. And I'm just a big fan of the local YMCA. Too. Mm. I mean, they have amazing studio space that sits quiet most of the time when they're not doing the booty bar. So. <laughs> yeah, well, I think what Prakash said is really uh, right on. Like, thinking about collaborating, there's, there's a mentality of kind of scarcity. Like, there, there are not enough resources, so anything that we can scramble for, we need to protect, you know? Mm. And there's a lot of territorialism, unfortunately. Um, but it, mm. it's, all, it's based in kind of a culture and a mentality that can be shifted. And if you just, you know, 
uh, realize that you can co cooperate and collaborate to solve some of these the most pressing pressing issues like space, um, you're stronger. You know, um, I think that's a really effective way to think about it. You know, it ties back to the technology, and the technology is a communication medium. Mm -hmm. It's it's just a way to connect people ultimately. You mm -hmm. know, what I mean, in fact, that's what we're doing. Like at the base of everything, right? We're just mm -hmm. creating ways for people to get together. Uh, just one more point to add, to add yeah. if you don't mind. Um, I, and I think, in my opinion, dance spaces have to probably start evolving into multi-purpose spaces. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, because if you think about a studio, just like if I think about uh, as a real estate owner or a, or a producer, uh, the num amount of time that a studio does not get used huh. is significant, right? So if we don't eventually move to a model, for example, I'm building something um, here in a bit that's, that's a multi-purpose space, which is obviously there is a dance space in there, but it's also a coffee shop. It is also an event space. It's also a social dance club. And I'm just maximizing it. But the only time that the studio would not get used is from 2 a.m. to 7 a.m. Mm. Uh, every other time it's getting used. That's awesome. So, so I think there's, there's a lot of value in bringing those kind of spaces that were, unless, unless you're very particular that your dance space has to be a certain way, uh, it, it enables the idea of you potentially being able to fund your own space. More people are interested in, in being partners with you because there's other aspects to it. Mm. Uh, and that solves some of these problems of just it being a dance studio. Yeah, yeah. Right. I love it. I think this is, um, I've been really inspired by these centers in Brazil um, that are run by Sesc or Sesky. Uh, they, you know, it's a giant foundation. They and, and focus on access, providing access to different things that people don't always have access to. I went to this one in Sao Paulo. It focused on three primary areas, the arts, athletics, and dentistry. And uh, it's like, <laughs> Sort of the holy trinity, <laughs> uh, but uh, it was like uh, actually super. I mean, it's kind of ridiculous and kind of profound. As someone who, who uh, works in the arts, this this oh. idea that the arts are not this thing separate from life, but actually the same thing as brushing your teeth, the same thing as going for a walk or a swim. And I think it also gets to what you were talking about that you know, these things, the proximity of these things being in the same place, was actually really powerful in the way that that positioned and arranged the arts in relationship to civic life, mm -hmm. in relationship to a healthy life. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this is actually really profound. And I, to me, that also then uh, begins to perhaps open up some other avenues for funding, whether it's earned or whether, like, perhaps you can start looking like health funding. Do you know? Like, it's yeah. the way that we are uh, situating our work within community, within city, um, I think actually has a lot of room for some um, some really interesting, powerful new relationships. Um, I would also say that there is a. Are you all familiar with National Sawdust in, in Williamsburg? Uh, it's a new music venue, but the, the structure that they used to get it built, I thought, was actually really interesting. Uh, it was. Uh, this is my sort of rough shorthand, so forgive me if I'm butchering this, but uh, a small group of investors bought the land, uh, got the building built. It's, the facility is run by a nonprofit. Uh, it's a music venue, also a community space. Um, the plan is that after X number of years, the investors will donate the property to the nonprofit, but they're able to donate it at the appreciated value, which in Williamsburg, five, six, seven years from now, is greatly appreciated. Mm -hmm. So that was a way of giving the investors a, a considerable return on their investment, even though it's all just basically tax write-off. Um, so anyway, I thought that was actually a really interesting idea. We're currently looking at a sort of hybrid model of uh, government funding, private uh, donation and ph philanthropic support, as well as private investment on a 24-acre site that we're working on in East Austin to achieve a lot of these things that we're talking about, of permanent affordability for artists. Um, and I do think, as part of that, that we have to look at ownership. Like, I think artists have to have some sort of long-term control and ownership over their own situations. Um, or this is just going to keep happening again. They put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears in, and energy into a space for like five years, and then they get priced out and have to go. So right. I, I do, to me, ownership is, or some, some variation or form of that mm -hmm. is really important. Yeah, and, and this model to me is also a means of how do you constantly bring people towards dance, right? Mm. I think the idea actually was inspired by this random event where 
uh, we were in a, in a fitness class, or fitness class was going on, and there was a, a four-year-old girl with, with her 65-year-old grandmother who came to, the cla who came to uh, get, a, get coffee. Um, and they watched this dance class, and they both came and attended the class. So there is a, a big pulling factor in, in making classes itself a performance aspect. Uh, if you notice, there are, I think Ballet Austin does this great thing where they have glass walls on their bottom floor. Everybody walking past it is looking at dance. So make, making dance more visible, even if it's just being taught, even if it's just a fitness class, is, is what this other model does is where it makes it more of a space where people are relaxing, doing their own thing, but they're constantly viewing dance. So that's a, that's a great point. And, and I also want to circle back to your comment about how you're using technology uh, with regards to your fundraising. Can you talk a little bit more about that specifically? Sure. Uh, it's, it's classified. But... <laughs> <laughs> they all have, everyone has clearance involved. Yeah. Uh, well, I think, I think it's an indirect relationship for me. Um, it's not, and you obviously the, the first thing that you think about for most people is, you know, is crowdfunding, uh, you know, GoFundMe or Kickstarter and things like that. But uh, that's one avenue, obviously, that's, that's very active. Uh, but for me, the technology aspect is most, more, more indirect. I think what it does for me is, is being able to use different, different technologies that are out there, including, you know, YouTube, be it, you know, web outreach, be it social media, uh, is, is more of building a, a base or building the right kind of links and the right kind of hookups to be it people, be it the end user, be it a uh, common audience that I can show. So for me, it's more projection. So uh, technology is, for me is always something that I can leverage to, to show that, okay, this kind of dance is being projected to so many people or this is the, this is the different aspects of it that it covers. And that's what the way in which we get funding um, is, is in two ways. One is obviously you know, the, the traditional routes of city and state mm -hmm. level funding which, for which you need this data anyway. Mm -hmm. But we also actively have a model where we treat it like any other investment model. If you're, if you're part of uh, you know, the stock, uh, stock market, mm -hmm. if you think about how people invest in diversified things, I, there, is a, there is a way of taking a subjective medium like dance and making it more objective, where people feel less risky in investing in something. Mm. And this is a way for me to do that is because I show them a diversified way of what they're investing in. Mm. Awesome. Uh, and, and so when an investor comes in, are they investing in particular, is, it, is that project-based? Yeah. Talk about that. Yeah, and that's, that's, that's actually one of the points that I wanted to talk about is we inherently, I think, at least most of the companies that I know, including us in the past, have been very project-focused. Uh, how many of you uh, apply for city funding here in Austin or any other city? <laughs> All right. How many of those are project-based funding? Okay, so the, 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 I think the shift that will slowly need to happen or you know, that kind of funding models might exist, but even in the city of Austin, for example, are, are a lot of the funding happens based on projects. Um, and what you're going to find is very few people from the, the private sector or from you know, angel investors. There will be people, but there's not going to be a lot of people investing in just a project. So I think the, the way to show or in, you know, improve that is to show them diversity. Um, to give you an example, I have a film fund that I work on, and that's talking about five films. Now, if I were an investor coming into it, I can be like, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to make this grand film. It's going to be like you know, this best ever, better than Titanic. Um, but but nobody, nobody's going to care. They're going to be like, okay, great, but you're, you're, the first, you're a first-time filmmaker. What, what do I know? Right. Right? So the way to make that more objective for them is, say, I'm going to make five films. The chances I suck at all five is probably very minimal. Uh, <laughs> um, and even if I make one of them work, you still make your money. Right? So what happens is you're diversifying the number of people you're approaching with this create smaller units, units of investment, hmm. but you're also diversifying the, and you put each of these films in different markets. You're not saying, I'll make five uh, romantic comedies. Uh, they might be great, but you might be a sucky romantic comedy director, right? <laughs> so, so what you want to do is try and diversify as much as you can, and, and this is not just film. Uh, I've found that even in our dance projects, for example, we do musicals. So let's assume that I'm saying, we have three musicals over the next three years, and this is our projection. So going to people and telling them that this is what it is, is, is I found it an easier sell. 
Um, and, and more importantly, they're investing in you, not a project. So that's very important to know that you have to come out as a completely rounded, knowing your plan sort of person, more than saying, this project is the best in the world. Uh, for, everybody says that. <laughs> Amazing. Do you have any other thoughts on sort of fundraising? Uh, just to jump on to diversity, you know, I think one, one of the reasons that we found ourselves increasingly, we started out mainly kind of working in contemporary uh, dance, uh, concert dance, you know, for the first year or so. Um, but we experimented with, uh, I'm not a dancer or choreographer, so I brought um, video and the theatrical and um, music, uh, original music into the, into the mix. Um, and thinking about a hybrid form, it opens up the number of venues we can look at. You know, we can, be, we can perform in a theater, we can perform in a gallery space. Um, and we can, and, and those are silos that are often sort of, you know, separate from each other in worlds that don't communicate as much. So mm. that helps you find, uh, find what you're looking for. We, we try to look for unexpected collaborations. Mm. So, you know, our, our previous show was uh, inspired by my grandparents' um, relationship. Uh, she grew up in Dresden during the war and he was American. Um, so, we, so it was thematically about war and seeing each other's enemies and trying to see each other's humans after war. Um, and so we thought about, you know, looking at uh, war museums and, uh, uh, you know, the military, veterans organizations, all of these organizations that would never, uh, you know, go out and look for a dance performance, you know, to, to and, and see if they would be a part of a collaboration, you know extremely diverse, you know, interdisciplinary, truly interdisciplinary, um, and first-time collaborations, you know, a dance, a dance or a theater presenter and a, and a war museum, maybe would never have met each other otherwise. Mm, right. Yeah. Mm. Oh, it's super interesting. Yeah. Um, I just want to check, are we, how are we doing, how are we doing on time? <laughs> oh, great, okay. We got 15 minutes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, let's let's talk a little bit about dance and social responsibility uh, and equity issues. Uh, to me, this is uh, just impossible to be living in our country right now, to be working as an artist uh, and not thinking about these issues. Uh, I think obviously our country has uh, a long, uh, complicated and by and large awful uh, sort of relationship, particularly around race and gender. And I feel like these issues are very um, front and center with our culture and our life right now. Um, and it's, it feels impossible to be running an arts organization or be an artist and not thinking about these, these issues. So I, I just kind of wanted to generally uh, open it up to you all and uh, see how you're thinking about uh, social responsibility, first of all, just as an artist, what that look, I feel like that can take any, obviously any number of forms. Uh, I think there's as many reasons for making dance as there are people in this room. There's obviously not like one reason to be doing this, but just wondering how you all are thinking about this, different strategies and tools and, uh, that, you're, that you're using and, and thinking about. So um, in my artistic direction of my own dance company. Uh, I made works that were, I thought were relevant, rele relevant to people of color in my community because I didn't really see that there were a lot of mm. um, ballets or marketing that was addressing the um, increasing minority majority in our city, mm -hmm. in Houston, and certainly in our state. Mm. Um, so uh, we did a Black History Month concert, so that was kind of um, empowering and raising um, untold stories, the stories of heroes and history and all of that. So that was kind of a, a centerpiece of our season. Um, but I also uh, would reach out to the community for their voices, mm. including them in the conversation as well as in some of the choreography and the stories that we told. Uh, mm. We developed also um, uh, a piece about Cesar Chavez and I was mm. kind of amazed been bringing um, high school kids to it who'd never heard of him, who were juniors in high school. Uh, and I raised the discussion with them about uh, who's, who's deciding what gets in your textbooks. Mm. Um, but that's Texas. Um, so they need to be aware that that's Texas, and that's not every place yeah, else. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, 
you know, so in a way it was kind of awareness raising and I always felt it was kind of a cool thing that maybe they'd come to, like we did one about comedians and mm. um, we explored the, uh, you know, your mama jokes and where that came <laughs> from and we had video clips and stuff and it was interesting, uh, you know, telling dozens. It was our 12th season, so I said we're going to play the dozens. Um, so, you know, it's just little things like that would just kind of spur off conversations because we'd always have a talk back. And, um, and actually exploring the fact that maybe something like the dozens isn't necessarily a good thing that our community has been known for. Mm. And so um, just raising discussions. Um, I've also participated in, um, so anyway, my company stands about immigrants, fair trade, organ donation, breast cancer, Underground Railroad, Saints, Sinners, and Slaves of Yesteryear and Today. <laughs> anyway, but I think our audience has always learned something new when they came to our concerts, mm. and we got a lot of information from first-time comers to dance that they would come back because there was something about them, mm. you know. They and they might maybe go over and see Houston Ballet Swan Lake. Now, mm. they'd seen some people dancing in point shoes about something that meant something to them. Mm. So I feel like a lot of the smaller and mid-sized organizations were doing some of that groundwork in Houston at the time that I came up to kind of be that bridge between the big ballet company and all the other companies. Mm. And so once we kind of filled that role and other people stepped into the fore, um, it was a good time to leave the scene. But um, I think it generated a lot of interesting ideas uh, amongst people about what they could do with dance. I was also um, taken part in um, mm. the Urban Bush Women's Leadership Institute, which I applaud. Mm. I saw pictures of the one I was involved in in New Orleans um, last night during Jawali's um, tribute. And uh, I think they do a beautiful job in showing you how to engage with your community and um, to incorporate some of those ideas. And I mean, we came to that with homework. You know, uh, it was, why are people poor? Well, wow. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, so we had discussions about that. We had discussions about racism. We had discussions about white privilege. We had discussions, and it was a mixed race um, group. It was um, activists, dancers, college professors, artists in the community, musicians. And then um, they, we pulled our resources and we put on three site specific works. It taught me a lot. Um, Liz Lemon was also part of that, and mm. all of her institutes and all of her community engagement stuff is really great as well. And even just sitting here watching you guys talk, I'm already picking up all your gestures. Um, <laughs> wanting to make a dance out of them. Um, so, you know, and, I, and as I usually, when I give a speech, you know, I, I once was asked to, and this is just a sidebar, but, you know, uh, give a valedictorian, you know, give a, give a speech for somebody's uh, high school. And I thought, oh God, you know, nobody remembers who spoke at their high school. Mm. So I made them dance. So I gave them five principles of their school. It was a Sacred Heart school. And every principal had a little dance move and the, and the whole audience learned it and then we did a little dance at the end. So I think any time you can open that door and let somebody come in and dance with you and show them how easy it is to compose. It's not so easy, but given the basic principles of composing a dance, mm. um, they're also feeling like they're a little more educated when they walk out, mm. like, oh, well, maybe, you know, we could put together a dance, you know, so why not? <laughs> so um, a lot of the reason I feel like I'm here and still in the dance community is that I'm, uh, and one of the things I explored at the Leadership Institute was yeah. that I'm a gatekeeper, but in a different way. So I got a chance to come and sit at the table. I've been part of Dance USA since it started. Mm. Um, so I've gotten to serve on its board. I was a dancer representative. You know, I've been a company member representative. And so I got a chance to sit at the table. So once I did, it's like, okay, so I've opened the door, let's open it for more people to come in. And I see that today after pulling out of Dance USA for a few years, I'm really excited to see some of the new values that are going on. But um, all that to say that we're all gatekeepers. We're, we decide who gets to come to dance. We decide who gets to, gets to dance. And even now in this new community I'm in with older people, they get to dance too, you know? I want to make sure that there's an opportunity for them. Because as um, Ms. Williams said, you know, it's such a profound experience we have dancing. Mm. And how dare we deny other people the opportunity to partake in it. So uh, one of the things I felt like Cookie asked us to do is ask you a question. And so one of the questions once you take into this, this um, conference is, who's not here? And why aren't they here? And invite them in. So, 
um, talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's it's remarkable. Uh, I think absolutely there's this question of uh, uh, how, <laughs> uh, not only who is on stage, but like who is invited and who is doing the inviting, mm -hmm. um, and how we make space for more people to be doing the inviting and pointing at what what the field is, uh, what we think of as the field. I think we need to. That's just like a, a lot of ongoing work. We need to keep creating space for other people to uh, shape and define what we're looking at and thinking about. Mm -hmm. Um, what, uh, what about you? How? Well, I think I look at it uh, in, in a couple of ways. One is, I think uh, the performing arts have a, have a unique ability in being able to convey something to somebody uh, without language. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it is a way or a medium for you to get more people to listen. Uh, and when I say listen, I include visual listening. Uh, I don't think it makes sense. But, um, but you get the point. Uh, what I'm trying to get, get at is, I think we have a unique capability or a unique responsibility mm -hmm. that we have better access to a lot more diverse diversity or a lot more people in communicating the same topics that cannot be done by speaking it or cannot be potentially mm -hmm. done by in one particular language or things That's like that. So I think I think art has to be a a medium for people to listen. But what you convey within that. I think obviously is, is potentially issues that you surround yourself in or mm -hmm. you expose yourself to or uh, you find yourself in, right? Mm -hmm. So, for example, the, the, the language that we work with, with the visually impaired, mm -hmm. is something that happened mostly because uh, I was finding that when I was working in that particular space, there was a big gap in, in how they express themselves mm -hmm. or, or, the, or the way they want to be taught. Um, so I, I just decided one day to blindfold myself and, and I tried dancing. Uh, and that changed a lot of things. Um, so I think experiencing mm. some of what you're speaking about is important mm. when you talk about social issues uh, or putting yourself in that space mm. clarifies what you're trying to say. I mean, I'm not saying that blindfolding myself is anyway equivalent to what they're going through, but, uh, but it gives you an idea of what the gap is. Right? Mm. So, so that's the two things. Is, is you have, I think you have a responsibility to be able to communicate to a larger audience mm. in what you're saying, but. Uh, also, the fact that you you should at least have some background in in the content of what you're saying. Mm. Mm. And, and, uh, yeah, well, I think connected to that, you know, it's important to to really listen and important to kind of be historians and and, uh, and try to understand the context mm. of the kind of uh, infrastructure in which we operate. Yeah. Um, like in a more traditional, you know, thinking about ballet, for instance, has its roots in Europe. In, in, yeah. in a very sort of patriarchal um, structure. And, that, and we've inherited that legacy. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's um, really important to be aware of that and to call it out and to be, as you mentioned, you know, to say something like, OK, here we are on stage, and there's three men on stage. Mm -hmm. And how, how does that connect to, uh, you know, is that in any way representative um, of the number of dancers, mm -hmm. you know, as far as gender goes, there are two white men on stage, you know, um, t to be able to, to recognize that, speak about that, you know, together is, is the first step. I mean, thinking about everything that's going on politically in the country right now, um, it, it, we need to be able to communicate uh, honestly about it first. And, and, and then, you know, those, those of us who you know, can recognize our privilege and the position of power that we have need to be able to, to work actively to, um, to, to listen to, to those voices that have not been, you know, uh, been able to express themselves. Listen to the voices on the margins. Yeah, mm. and, and it's interesting because it's often, I, I often find that those, um, that um, groups in the margins are working at a really interesting places uh, aesthetically and artistically and creatively be because of not necessarily being uh, having access or you know having gatekeepers keep them out of whatever this established thing was you know a lot of marginalized and underserved populations are actually working on in the most kind of innovative and and uh, 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 relevant contemporary kind of ways yeah, yeah absolutely My a good friend, Kara Martinez, who has been working with us on this Think East project, she just finished her PhD 
on the history of experimental sort of radical performance uh -huh. in, East, in East Austin. And she was looking at these for, sort of cultural expressions that are typically not viewed through that lens, but they're act, like the Juneteenth parade. is actually mm -hmm. this amazing, mm -hmm. actually super contemporary radical yep. performance right. um, that is typically not viewed through that lens, but it's actually mm -hmm. just as, as contem contemporary and radical and experimental right. as a lot of the stuff that we kind of view over here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think it's, it's really essential that we keep allowing different lenses to help us articulate and look at things mm -hmm. uh, and define things in different ways. I know one of the more profound things we did at, at the Leadership Institute I was involved in in New Orleans with Urban Bush Women was that there was a local drummer who was very famous and, and on the streets and he had just recently died and so um, they, they actually <laughs> Instead of having him lay in state, they had him like standing up in front of a drum, which was really bizarre. But then they had um, a front, a uh, second line, and so we took the morning off and we went and participated in that. And wow, what a profound thing that was! And awesome. you know, I just recognized um, how art and just that procession and that dancing and that music helps people with grief. And I moved to Wimberley, which is north of here, um, west of here, which had a huge flood on Memorial Day a year ago. And 12 people died. It was a huge, massive um, tidal, tidal wave basically came down and took out a lot of the trees along the river. And so I was coming to a, also into a community that felt like they were grieving, mm -hmm. that they were tired. And, the, and I thought, you know, what can dance bring to this? Well, one of the local churches had also decided, well, let's bring in one of these second-line bands from New Orleans who's used to going around and kind of ministering to people, and it was something really neat and deep about that. And so I think that social responsibility can be right where you are, mm. noticing what's happening around you, mm. and, you know, mm. if it's Black Lives Matter, mm -hmm. going and participating in some kind of a protest act, mm. uh, like we did at Rice University in Houston, and we just stood for an hour with signs, some people laid on the ground, chalk around them. I mean, but it's, it doesn't have to be all, a lot of movement, um, but it's standing in solidarity with your community um, and trying to offer them something with your art form that can really help them through the process of grief or loss or, you know, new life and let's move on. Um, I think that's an important way that we as artists can contribute as well. So the social responsibility isn't always about something deeply political. Mm. It can be about just life's happening. Yeah. Yeah. Participate yeah. actively as a citizen yeah, exactly. at the same time as being yeah, as a, yeah, an yeah. artist. I yeah. love it. Yeah. Well, I think we are now actually at a moment where we are wrapping up this portion. Uh, we're going to continue this conversation hopefully over uh, the next few days and we'll uh, have another one of these conversations on Saturday. We hope you join us and hope you join us throughout the next couple days uh, in between uh, panels, shows, over drinks, over food. Love to, to hear your own thoughts uh, and continue to, to hash some of these ideas out. Um, I think that's over it. Uh, Amy was going to come back and... <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Thank you. It was extremely interesting, extremely interesting. Lots of great stuff and good food for thought. So thank you so much. Thank you. Let's have one more round of applause for our plenary speakers. Thank you. So now we get to go on to lunch. So I'm the bearer of good news. There are food trucks outside under a tent so if you, uh, or a canopy. So if you head out and head to the left towards the Palmer Event uh, Center, that's where there are some food trucks. They are um, uh, for your own purchase. And then I know that some of you were wanting to have conversations um, that came up from a manager's listserv around performances. Um, if you know what that means, you can gather at the registration table in the lobby. Some people are gathering there. I also would like to just take this moment while I still have you as a captive audience and ask you to give a really warm round of applause for the Dan USA Board of Trustees. These are 
volunteer members from all over the country who work in our dance field. We have over 40 trustees right now. Um, you can read about them on our website. They all came in a day or two early for our meetings. Um, so very grateful for your leadership and your voice. I also would like to take this moment and thank the amazing Dance USA staff who is hiding. <laughs> So please thank them when you see them. I hope you have a great day, and I'll see you outside.